So welcome everybody. This is um, a lecture discussion of Pathwork Guide Lecture number 175, uh, 1996 edition. Uh, it was delivered September 2nd, 1969 originally, and it's titled Consciousness Fascination with Creation. And I want to welcome everybody here. So if anybody had a chance to look at it or work with it beforehand and want to make a comment, um, we can have a little opening and then we'll get into just reading and discussing the lecture. No comment, okay. So, um, And really always, you know, feel the presence of the energy of the guide as we, you know, read these words. And so just, you know, see if you can allow yourself to be receptive as you hear this lecture. It's, it's a deep lecture. It's, you know, dealing with some very powerful understandings and kind of what I understand myself as sort of the primary spiritual discipline of the path work. And so... He begins, greetings, all my friends here who receive tangible blessings in the form of energy currents containing consciousness and strength. They flow toward you and permeate you. They are a reality that can be perceived as your own consciousness grows and ventures forth. So just take a moment and see if you in this moment can perceive this you know, this source of strength and consciousness always flowing toward you and permeating you. And as we, I think, you know, do do this work, we, we become more and more conscious and aware of this level of things. Um, so then he begins the uh, topic of this lecture. He said, I would like to talk about aspects of consciousness and its significance in the scheme of creation. Creation is indeed a result of consciousness and not as generally assumed the other way around. Nothing can be unless it first exists in consciousness. Whether the consciousness is the universal spirit, the universal self, or whether it is the individualized self, whether your consciousness perceives, creates, and formulates something important, world-forming, or just a passing insignificant attitude. The principle is the same. So, and here he sort of introduces, uh, you know, some categories that I think are, are useful. Uh, this sort of begins a whole, I think, season of these lectures along these lines. And so, you know, he's talking about here, you know, that there's these, uh, different spheres of consciousness. So there's the individualized self sphere of consciousness, which is the one we're most familiar with and you know, where we mostly operate out of. But always, you know, with that, you know, there is also uh, the universal self, universal spirit, right? And um, in some ways I'm, I'm reading uh, Paul Levy's quantum revelation, Right. And, and it's very, very similar to what the guide is saying here, you know, and he's talking about, you know, sort of the, the understanding that, you know, quantum physics has really brought, you know, to us and, you know, how that is figuring in and prefiguring into all of what's going on here as well. Um, and how there is this sort of quantum field that would be similar to the universal spirit in the way the guide speaks or, or universal self that we're all connected to, right? And uh, so it's a kind of co-creating thing with this uh, field as well. And the guide talks about how we, with our consciousness impress uh, a field he calls the soul substance, right? So I think there's a lot of similarities here. Um, so he goes on, he says, whether your consciousness perceives creates and formulates something important. Oh, I read that, yeah. So um, for, for if you do not know that you have created your experience, you feel helpless in the hands of a power you cannot comprehend. 
And this power is truly your own consciousness, my friend. So I'm kind of skipping over here through. So maybe, you know, like he's, he's saying here that we overlook the tremendous significance of your conscious creations. And, and our disconnection from them causes real suffering. And he says, no other suffering is as acute as the one felt when you do not know that you have created what you experience. And it's like, when that happens, you know, you just feel helpless in the hands of something that you can't understand. So let us understand a little better some of the most outstanding attributes of consciousness. Consciousness is not only the power to think, to discriminate and to choose. It is not only the power to know, to perceive and to feel. It is also the ability to will. Willing is a very important aspect. If we understand the quantum nature of reality aspect of consciousness, whether you will with awareness or whether you disconnect from your will makes no difference. And your will is an aspect of your consciousness and hence of what you continually create. So this is where we get kind of lost and blind. And I think he goes into this a little more in the lecture, you know, but you know, we, we have an unconscious aspect of ourselves that we're not so aware of that often has a willing, you know, that's con you know, contrary to our conscious willing. And then we get mixed results and we don't understand where that's coming from. And so when we can understand that, you know, there are different aspects of consciousness within us that have different existence, knowing, feeling, willing, right? You know, so that we're, you know, different. Uh, we're kind of a conglomeration of beings, right? We're not just one unified being. And then we can begin to explore and understand more of, you know, all of our aspects and their, their effect on, you know, what we're manifesting. So anybody want to put any comments here or have any questions? So continuing, often a number of contradictory will currents short circuit on the surface. And that can manifest as a lack of awareness or numbness. Consciousness is diminished on the surface, but it continues to be active below the surface. Its products manifest as tangible life experiences and you feel at a loss. Believing that what life brings is independent from your own willing and knowing. So any path of genuine development must bring all the confused and contradictory desires, beliefs, and the inner knowing to the surface so that life circumstances appear in their true light as the creation of the self. And then this awareness gives you power to recreate. So willing and existing possibility, determining, formulating, knowing it and perceiving these inner activities are tools of your creative consciousness. And humanity can be divided into those who know this and use the tools deliberately, creatively, constructively, and those who are unaware of it and victims of their ignorance and are constantly creating destruction without ever knowing it. And of course, you know, there's many gradations in between, you know, and to some degree, we all are unconsciously, you know, manifesting, you know, things um, and also, you know, uh, working with this universal spirit, you know, in different ways um, that may not seem to be exactly what we expected, but, you know, as we stay with it, we discover, oh, that was like in divine perfection in some way that was beyond our ability to comprehend, right? So, you know, there's, there's lots of ways that we can begin to dance with this, uh, you know, larger co-creation aspect, right? But um, again, we have to sort of see where the unconscious is maybe creating negatively. So the human being is the first entity on the upward evolutionary scale who can deliberately create with consciousness. You, my friends who search for your true identity, 
must come to experience your power to create. And specifically, how you have created whatever you do or do not have now. You can then see how fighting against your own creations augments the pain and tension in your being. This is inevitable when you are not yet aware, generally and superficially, of how your life is the outcome of your mental activity. What you do not like, you will invariably rebel against, never knowing that you actually tear yourself apart even more. The rebellion may not be entirely conscious either. It may manifest as vague discontent with life, hopeless longing, a sense of futility and frustration from which you see no way out. The discontent too is a kind of rebellion. So I think that's like worth pausing and you know, sitting with a minute, you know, and, and, and you know, like we, we're often kind of looking for like these specific, you know, correspondences around, you know, how we create something. But if we really look at just the, the energies, right, that, that we're in, and so are we, you know, in some kind of rebellion or vague discontent, you know, um, you know, we, we may feel like we can't control it, you know, and it's not, the guy doesn't suggest that we control it, you know, that we don't try to rise above it, that's not the answer, but that we, you know, become conscious of it, right, and be with it, even befriend it, right, so that we can, you know, talk to that discontent with life, that hopeless longing, that sense of futility and frustration within us, um, you know, to, to speak to the, the rebellion. Um, Can I uh, jump in, Carolyn? Sure. Um, I, I, my mind is trying to grasp part of the reality of life that I create all of my reality. Yeah. I mean, I, I, when I, where I get confused, it's like, well, it rained last night, and I don't create that. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, uh, I just kind of, I, I'm just trying to wrap my brain. I get that yeah, I, I, get, I see the things happen, how I react to them and how I make choices. That's my, I get that. Yes. Yes. But, and, 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 and that's good, but it, you're right. You know, it's like, it's, it's even in a larger scale. So, but this is the question, you know, is like, we have to ask who is the I, right? And, and so, when we understand that we are all so one with and connected to this universal spirit or universal self, right, you know, and that maybe the rain is, who knows, the collective tears of all humanity in this region, I don't know, you know, but, you know, there's, there's some kind of, you know, way that, you know, or, or, you know, even together we've, you know, you know, that, that co-arising, you know, is part of in the quantum realm, you know, uh, a creation, and, and it's not really a, a separate from it, creating it. It's like we are within it, and it is us. And so the whole world is sort of in this quantum way of, of understanding, right? You know, and it's, it's all a dream scape, similar to our night dreams, right? That, that also, you know, seem to have a whole, whole life of their own, but, you know, we can, we can kind of grasp that. So it can be a helpful metaphor, right? And, and it is, you know, you might take a look at this book uh, and see what you think about it, you know, and he's not a physicist, you know, he's coming at it from this way of, well, what does that mean for humanity? And, and he really believes that this is the, you know, paradigm shift that we need. And if we can really grasp this and understand this, it's the gift and it's the, you know, the, the awakening of the, you know, whole planet potentially. So, you know, I, and the guide is, is also, you know, calling us in a way to these deeper, you know, understandings now of our, you know, collective and, you know, quantum creative reality. Does that make sense? Does that help? Well, a little bit. I mean, I, I, I get that, you know, like, well, give 
you know, global warming is an example that's very clearly to me uh, is a result of the consciousness of the human planet right now. Um, and that's a, that's a clear result of our intentions, our, our awareness, if you will. Um, but um, things happen in life. So my, my understanding based is based in, in, on the pathwork is that I'm can react any way I can to rain. I can be angry that it's going to rain, or I can welcome the rain, or I can just watch my emotions. That seems to be where I have the consciousness, the awareness, not not the ability to kind of even collectively control the rain, which was good. We needed the rain, but uh, as far as that, that but, goes, right. And, and, you know, it's like, it's tricky, you know, because it's like exactly what you're saying. And it's really important that we recognize, you know, at that level, you know, where we are, you know, creating our responsibility is our ability to respond to what is, right? But this is really saying something different, right? Classical physics says that there's an objective reality out there. The guide and quantum mechanics says, no, it's consciousness impressing soul substance, reflecting back to you, every bit of it, the office that you're sitting in right now, you created, it's part of your dreamscape. You know, it's a, a little more objective than your night dream <clears throat> places, right? You know, in some way it has a little more material reality, right? But ultimately it's based on quantum reality. And it's, it's created by your presence, your consciousness in the mix. So, you know, it's like, it's also an expression of who you are, you know, and then the rest of the world is, you know, yeah, like, we're, you know, it's this collective, you know, so it's all an expression of all of us and what's within each of us is, is sort of in, within all of us. And, and yeah, there are ways that we can see, like, you know, one of the things that Paul Levy talks about is how, um, you know, qu quantum physics basically, you know, in a scientific realm several, you know, 50 years ago, and it takes about 50 years for these paradigm shifts to shift into the zeitgeist of, of mass consciousness. So, you know, that, that there was this, um, you know, understanding in the very beginning, you know, like Einstein, you know, couldn't really stand the theory, you know, even though it kept being accurate and kept, you know, pr predicting everything and, and like that. So, you know, but it, it really does take away this thought that there is any kind of objective reality that there is no out there reality it's all a co-participation um i don't know if i can find one of his quotes but i think it's good just to just you know like it is this is the hard part but it also has you know like like where let's say you have you know the saints or the you know, like Christ, right? You know, he said, well, you know, like if you fully understand this, you'll be able to do, you know, greater miracles than I. Well, you know, if we're really going to, you know, evolve and establish Christ consciousness on the earth, right? I think this is the fundamental understanding partly that he's bringing, you know, we have to get out of our materialism, which is what the guide says is one of the aspects of the, you know, lower self. Like, so there's, you know, the materialism, there's the separation. And then there's the half-truths, lies, and, you know, confusion. And so the half-truths, lies, and confusion kind of started with the beginning of quantum theory because it, like, pulled the whole rug out from under reality. And nobody knew what it was anymore, right? You know, and, like, we, you know, everything that we thought we stood on. And so we were all, like, lost and confused. And, and I think that now it's, it's like kind of coming into these larger systems of, you know, human consciousness and, and we don't trust and nothing seems accurate or, you know, you know, totally correct in any of its expressions. And, you know, there's all of this, you know, distortion and separation and a lot of outright lies and half-truths and confusion that also are, you know, part of this. So, you know, I think we're, we're really living in this process right now of this transformation of paradigms. And we're stepping out of our old three-dimensional classical physics reality and trying to learn and embody and understand this other larger 
quantum reality. And I think the guide speaks of it. So let's continue with the guide. Does that, how's that? Dick, is that good? Yeah, I'm good for now. I just wanted yeah. to say that I, there was one sentence in there that really uh, kind of slapped me in the face back a little bit where he says, human beings are the lowest, uh, lowest entity on the evolutionary scale. The first entity on the upward evolutionary scale, uh, the right? The first entity on the upward evolutionary scale who can deliberately create with consciousness. Uh, that's a huge statement. I mean, what does a bird do when it's building a nest? Is, is it not creating with consciousness? I mean, I, I, sometimes the guide's, you know, understanding of nature is not exactly the same as mine, you know, so I, I'm <laughs> not sure that I, I could, you know, always agree with some of these statements, but here, I don't know, I mean, even in the native tradition, right, you know, they talk about the medicine wheel, and they say that, you know, all life is born automatically knowing its place on the medicine wheel, which is based on what you have to give away one to another. Right. And that's how the whole flow of, of life continues. And he says the human being is the only being, you know, that doesn't automatically know where its place is on the medicine wheel. It's a, what they call a determining being. And its job in this lifetime is to determine its place on the medicine wheel by discovering what it has to give away. So I think, you know, it's kind of, there's some truth in it, you know, to me from that perspective. Now, whether other beings, I mean, I find that more and more as we seem to be, you know, coming into greater conscious awareness, you know, but even science, and certainly I am experiencing, you know, animals as being much more sentient and plants as being much more sentient than our consciousness usually would give credit to, you know, but that's that materialism that does, that doesn't see spirit in everything, right, and whether that's all, all that spirit is, that's within, you know, the trees and the birds and the animals, you know, can deliberately create with consciousness, I'm not sure, but, you know, it's like, it's part of what we know we, we do, so. Isn't consciousness the uh... In, in that context, the ability to observe myself building a nest as opposed to just intuitively, instinctly building a nest. You know, that, isn't that the difference? Well, it was certainly one of them. Yeah, you know, uh, you know that you're, you're sort of doing it instinctively or intuitively. I mean, I do a lot of things intuitively, right? You know, and so, um, and yet, you know, there's an, an, a conscious intention underneath that to you know, be listening to, you know, something, you know, like that's kind of my note or something in the universe, right? <laughs> so ready to go on? Let's see. So I guess we read this, you know, it's like, that, you know, it's like we, when we fight against our own creations, you know, that's where, and this is where the guide says, you know, there's soft pain in the world, right? Which is where, you know, we might not get our needs met or we might have to suffer, you know, harm or physical pain or death, you know, but he says the real suffering comes from, you know, the, the contraction against the soft pain, which creates hard pain. And so when we contract against and rebel against the soft pain of what is, that what, you know, what is is our creation, what is is, you know, where we are in the world right now, you know, it's like, and, and so we need to sort of receive that present as a presence, right? You know, it's the gift of, of where we are. And when we rebel against it, um, you know, then, you know, like he says here, we're tearing ourselves apart even, more because we're splitting inside um but and but we're also uh you know sort of blocking the movement that's trying to happen right and so this is where our our resistance can be something that we can also just 
be aware of, right? We can't make it go away, right? It comes alive inside of us. And so, you know, we, we welcome it, but we, we seek to be, you know, understanding it. And that's bringing more, you know, consciousness, conscious awareness to it rather than unconsciously identified with it and acting out. So he says, to understand the nature of consciousness in still greater depth, you need to see what positive and negative directions consciousness can take. You have within you the purest wisdom flowing toward ever expanding bliss, toward an infinite variety of new life expressions and the fullness of dimensions. This is the universal spirit. I am not saying that the universal spirit is in you. I am saying that you are it, but most of the time you do not know it. So that's a big statement there, right? But that's a part of what we're talking about, right? We have to expand our concept of, you know, who we are in this new realm. So, and part of it is when we can tap into this, you know, area of the wisdom and the bliss, you know, that's where we can, you know, like probably find our way out of this kind of crisis that we've created, right? <clears throat> and again, the crisis is its own medicine, you know, at, at some level. So, you also harbor within you the distorted expression of your creative consciousness with which you will negative and destructive results. One could also say that this is the eternal fight between God and the devil, between good and evil, between life and death. It does not matter what you call these powers. Their names depend on culture, fashion, interpretation, personal preference and approach to the world. Whatever you name them, they are your own powers. You are not a helpless pawn in anyone's hands. This is the all important fact that truly alters your entire self perception and attitude toward living. Not knowing this will make you feel constantly victimized by circumstances beyond your control. And I mean, you know, this even, you know, like, I mean, I know that we all are working to, you know, not feel victimized by, you know, our immediate, you know, relationship dynamics or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's like, I think we're all feeling, you know, the shaking that's going on. And maybe we've personally had the effects of, you know, systems that are not working so well right now, or, you know, like fears of, of the future in some way, right? That, um, you know, is kind of like, well, we, we, you know, we don't know where we're going. And it all seems to be, you know, like beyond us, right? Nobody seems to be in charge of this bus right now. So, you know, we're, we're trying to take back a certain perspective, you know, from the individual human self sphere, you know, that's true. <laughs> you know, we're small, we don't, we can't, you know, control the world, but there's, there's more here. And maybe there's deeper questioning or deeper ways that we can influence what's out there that we don't know about yet. So in order to perceive and experience your true identity as universal spirit, three conditions are necessary. You must tune into it. Knowing of its existence will make this possible. You activate the universal spirit by your deliberate attempt to listen to it. So, you know, tune into that, you know, like, because there's a kind of way that the ego sort of unconsciously, you know, makes us go unconscious, right? You know, and, and we, don't, we don't even realize, but we're just sort of, un, you know, habitually, trying to do it ourselves. We're not, not trying to listen to anything, any wisdom, any, you know, like we might feel tired. We, you know, say what's wrong with me. I can't, you know, instead of like looking to spirit to, you know, give us strength or, you know, energy or help us dispel whatever spirit of, you know, heaviness or whatever that has settled into us, right? You know, when everything becomes spirit, <laughs> everything that's going on, you know, is, is like, you know, like in this field and it interpenetrates you and it's outside of you, but it's also inside of you. 
So I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, part of tuning into it is, uh, you know, feeling it inside of our bodies, noticing, you know, it kind of outside and, and also, you know, really seeking to ask or to become quiet, as he says, within ourselves, then we can allow it to happen. And of course, <laughs> this is not as easy as it may sound. You know, this is where we really are so much into our active uh, aspects that we, we don't know how to allow spirit to move through us and then to prompt us, right? You know, when it's our, our moment. Um, so this is not as easy as it may sound for the tumultuous static of the busy mind keeps blocking this possibility. Our thoughts, you know, are always, you know, sort of distracting us. And, you know, in, in some ways we're like, whose thoughts are they? You know, I mean, we, we identify with them. We think they're ours, but, you know, in some ways there's a whole field again, you know, of static mental, you know, thinking processes going on. And, and so oftentimes, you know, it's like, I don't know if anybody's ever been in a deep, kind of more like in a meditative state or whatever. And all of a sudden you're, you're aware all of, that there's this conversation going on between people inside of your head and you have no idea who they are and you've never met them. And the conversation is completely irrelevant to your life. And, you know, it's like, oh, where, you know, where is this guy? You know, it's like in the airwaves, right? And then the, the feelings are there too. And usually we hook into the feelings a little more. Um, so, you know, as we become calm, and, and work with sort of stilling the mind so that it's less producing of involuntary thoughts. And I don't know if anybody gets completely rid of them, but you know, when they happen, there's a, a way also that you're more present to them, right? And so they're not as distracting. And so once you have accomplished this to some degree, you will experience an emptiness. And he has a whole lecture on this creative emptiness said you will then seem to listen into nothingness. That may even be frightening or disappointing. Finally, the universal spirit will begin to manifest, not because it decides to reward you for having been a good child who now deserves it, but because you begin to perceive its ongoing presence. Knowing that this presence was always there and immediately accessible, almost too near to be perceived. And this is, this is really a kind of a true key as well, right? You know, it's like it's ongoing and it's already here right now, already here right now. And we can tune into it, right? It's just that we're, we're my, our mind is usually, you know, it's like it's subtle, it's in it's a different wavelength. And so, and it's right next to us. And so we just don't even realize it's there. So see if you want to take a minute right now, right? And just see if you can close your eyes and, you know, allow your breath to bring your consciousness into the present moment and into your body. And, you know, just allow any relaxation, any calming that, you know, can, you know, being just aware of where there might be some tension in your body or some, thoughts racing around, just, you know, signal a little space, a little cocoon of calm, you know, it's okay, you can relax, I'm here, you know, you're, you're present with it, you're seeing it, you're aware, and you can become the, you know, inner voice that can be, you know, a guide, and a trustworthy guide for all of these energies inside of you. And, and then you can, you know, even let go of that part of you, which is kind of your, your ego self's, you know, interface with the higher self and just, you know, allow, you know, the, you know, the, the opening to guidance to universal spirit to the sense of the presence, you know, maybe you don't get anything specific but you feel the life force there within you. You feel the consciousness that you are as something beyond 
your ego consciousness. It can observe your ego consciousness. It can observe your feelings. It can observe your body. So whatever is it's observing, you know, it's like that's not who you are. You are the observer. And that can, you know, it's like it's a it's a verb, you know, it's an ongoing activity. It's never stopping, never absent. And again, because you begin to perceive its ongoing presence, you know, you, you can open to receive the manifestations that might come to you to help you, to guide you. The first manifestations may not come to you as a direct voice, a direct inner knowing, but through detours, through other mouths, and later as apparently coincidental ideas that suddenly occur to you. If you are alert and sensitive, attuned to inner reality, you will know that these are the first signs of establishing contact with the universal spirit. Later, the emptiness will prove to be a tremendous fullness, impossible to express in words. Its immediacy also hinders you from perceiving the universal spirit's constant presence. The immediacy is, of course, wonderful when you discover that you harbor this presence within yourself at all times. It will fill you with safety, with strength, with the knowledge that you never need to feel inadequate and helpless again. For the source of all life supplies you with every smallest detail of living that is important to you. The inner source fills you with rich feelings. It stimulates and calms you. It shows you how to handle problems. It offers solutions that unify decency, honesty, and self-interest, love and pleasure, reality and bliss, fulfillment of your duties without diminishing your freedom in the least. It contains everything. However, this wonderful immediacy presents problems at first because you believe that all this can be sought only very, very far away. Since you were geared to experience the universal spirit only as a remote reality, you find it impossible to experience its nearness. You must fully experience, and this is number two, right? So we, you must fully experience and comprehend the part of our consciousness that has become negative and destructive. We have concentrated heavily on accomplishing this in the path work, but this is not easy precisely once again, because we are geared to believe that our life is a fixed mold we were put into, and we must learn to cope with independently of our inner process of thinking, willing, knowing, feeling, and perceiving. As you can now appreciate, it requires a great deal of honesty, discipline, and effort to overcome resistance to make this all-important switch in your entire approach to life. From feeling helpless to seeing life as your own creation in all respects. It is not possible to activate the ever-present universal self when you are still blind to your negative creations. Sometimes certain channels happen to be unobstructed. But where the blocks, the blindness, <coughs> the imagined helplessness persists, you cannot contact your universal self. And three, your conscious thought processes give you the first possibility to contact the universal spirit. You create with your conscious thinking just as much as with your unconscious thinking and willing. Your thinking ability is the same as the creative processes of the universal mind. Through your consciousness, though your consciousness is a separated fragment of the whole, it has the same powers and possibilities. The separation is not even real. It exists only because you experience yourself as separate at this time. 
The moment you discover the immediacy of this presence, you will no longer feel a separation between your thoughts and those of the greater being. Eventually they will merge and you will realize that the two have always been one. You do not avail yourself of your innate powers. You leave them unused or even misuse them in your blind state. You can finally begin to experience yourself as the universal spirit by using your conscious thoughts in a deliberate, constructive way. You can do this in two steps. First, you must clearly see how you have unknowingly used your mental processes negatively, thereby creating destructively. And, and again, this is also where we've also looked, you know, at the certain levels of where the, you know, the defense, you know, the image creates, you know, the, the belief and, and the way things are that have to be defended against, you know, by the, you know, immature child consciousness's formula of, of a defense, right? And, and so all of this creates, you know, the recreation of the same dynamic in our, you know, adult lives or as we go forward, you know, because where there's this particular soul bent, you know, we're, we're continuing to, to manifest that. So this can be understood psychologically fairly well, I think, but I think he's also asking us to think of this as, as a soul substance, energetic, consciousness impressing, dream creating kind of way that we, we also are manifesting these things in our lives. I mean, in this book on quantum physics, you know, it talks about sort of this almost immediate response when we approach the quantum field of whatever our experience is projecting, you know, on it, you know, our own viewpoint, our own lens, and it immediately responds, right? And, and so, you know, it's, 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 very easy to say, well, see, I know, I knew it all along, you know, there it is, you know, the guy talks about this, you know, it's like, so, and, and, you know, so we're trying to kind of just slow this down a little bit and, and really realize that, you know, there is a psychological aspect, there is a, you know, like a, an approach of just the willingness to, you know, accept reality and work with it as it is now, which can be very, you know, useful and honest and effective, right, um, in, in the whole journey. But I, I think for the journey that we're coming into in the future and, and even, you know, to, to really do the transformation that life is calling us into, if we can begin to entertain and try to imprint, you know, this new paradigm, this new possibility into consciousness now. And so that's a part of what he's talking about, you know, and, you know, there's a reason to, you know, seemingly to use this to imprint, right? And then there might be others, you know, for yourself where you see some kind of image and you want to, you know, like re, like imprint the truth, right? Instead of the false belief and the, the, you know, dynamic within the image. So this is where he has another lecture where he talks about Im impression and impressing, right? You know, and so this is where consciousness impresses the soul substance and we do it unconsciously and in the negative, you know, or sometimes consciously negatively. And, and we also, you know, are learning how to, you know, choose to impress it consciously from the you know, from the guidance of the universal self. So by building thought forms of creative unfoldment, you can tap the rich source within your own being. You begin with conscious thinking, which requires focusing attention on your thinking processes, much too close to be easily recognized, observing how you use them. You know, and this is kind of like really subtle in attitudes and you know, in, in, in energy currents, right? You know, it's not so much what we say, but the, the carrier band that we're sending it out on that is creative. And so, you know, if we're sending out a slight carrier band of, you know, judgment or hostility, you know, don't be surprised if you get back, you know, somebody's defense or somebody's, you know, offense. So, um, you know, there's, there's a way that we want to, 
you know, penetrate and understand, you know, what we are expressing and where it is kind of unconsciously negative. And then he says, by building thought forms of creative unfoldment, we tap the rich source within our own being. And, you know, like we can, you know, I like what he says, observing how you use them, then how they create both what you do have and do not have, right? You know, so, so this is a, a lot of what our whole defense process is around is our unmet needs from childhood, right? You know, that carry on and our fear in life that we're not going to have everything we need, right? And, and this is a creative aspect of consciousness that actually calls forth to it, you know, that scarcity or that, you know, potentiality of experiencing, you know, at least from one perspective that we don't have what we, we need. But in some ways, you know, it's like this quantum field that responds to our creative consciousness really is able to, you know, supply everything that we do need. And again, we just have to, you know, like waken to understand what, you know, what we're working with here and, and who we really are ultimately, right? So once you can recognize these processes, you have discovered a tool of creation. You become truly your real self for you are the universal spirit who created the world, who create is creating the world, right? I would say. You are constantly creating your world right now. It is the life you lead. Paying attention to your inner processes will reveal that much of what you thought was unconscious is not as hidden at all. Observe this, especially when you find yourself in a disturbing situation. See how you take so much for granted that you gloss over your most obvious attitudes, exactly those which will give you clues to understand how your creative powers work. In this case, of course, they are inverted manifesting negative. Considering every detail of the situation, expanding the range of your attention by finding a fresh approach will bring the insight you have been lacking so far. This self-knowledge is purification in the truest sense because ultimately it establishes your own awareness of your power to create your own life. Discovering how you have created destructively is never just a bad experience, for it becomes immediately obvious that you also have the power to create beautiful life experiences for yourself. You become immediately aware of your eternal nature with its infinite power to expand. <clears throat> so you see, my friends, we are dealing here with three levels and all of them must become accessible. They are all equally difficult to perceive. It would be an error to believe that your everyday thinking processes are easier to perceive than either your destructive willing or your divine nature with its endless power and wisdom. They are all equally near and seem far only because your vision is turned away from them. So, you know, this could be some homework, you know, to just explore looking at, you know, and turning your vision towards each of these in some, you know, intentional process. Both the willful destructive and the great destructiveness and the great creative spirit you really are, are unconscious only because you do not give their existence the benefit of the doubt as a first step toward discovering them. The same is true of your daily mental activity, which goes on unobserved without critical evaluation. So you are unaware of how your thoughts run in the same unproductive negative channels, nor do you see that you derive a sort of satisfaction from allowing the inattention to go on. When you observe your negative thoughts, it is important to realize what they do to you, how they connect with the very result you deplore most in your life, that you have the power to alter them and find new avenues of expression for your thoughts. So let's say that again. When you observe your negative thoughts, it's important to realize what they do to you, how they connect with the very results you deplore most in your life, and that you have the power to alter them and find new avenues of expression for your thoughts. So these two realizations will make all the difference in the world because they bring true liberation and self-finding. 
the coming into one's own we speak so much about. The discovery of your true identity, you know, and here, you know, you kind of have to step into, you know, if like you go into, you know, like looking at, you know, your uh, negative creation from the idealized self image, from the inner critic, from the, you know, superimposed conscience, you know, then that, you know, you can't, you, you, you know, you have to recognize that that's really, you know, not what this is talking about, right? When we face and truly see, you know, our own creation, like you said before, you know, it's like, it's kind of an immediate realization of, of our true capacity, our true power and, and the freedom that we have then to, you know, transform and create positively. And oftentimes, you know, it takes suffering, you know, it, it takes like this awareness of the consequence of what we're, you know, doing um, in deeper ways to kind of wake us up. So oftentimes our close loved ones, you know, they play these roles, you know, with us, for us, you know, of, you know, trying to help us, you know, recognize. And, and of course, they're also caught up in their own projection and their own co-creation, you know, out of it. But again, there's this mutual co-arising, this mutual emergence of, you know, like, how did you guys even meet, right? You know, you know, the guide is saying there are no accidents. Like we magnetize to us everything and we literally, our consciousness creates it instantaneously. So just some things to think about, right? <laughs> Any comments, questions? Did I pause here? This section as a whole is really speaking to me for lots of reasons. <laughs> um, but just the, uh, and I, I think I've really been kind of getting to this thought place a little bit in our conversations that when at least the way I've described it with you has been when I step out of my own way with that voice the voice that's saying all the negative things and instead say okay like I hear you but you are all my hurt thoughts talking what else is there it's like moving the veil and seeing behind it and seeing that that is not all of reality. It is an augmented negative piece of reality and being able to move that a little bit and look around it and see what else there is has really helped me gain some insight into like, okay, this feels negative and that's also not the whole picture. There is something to be done about it, even if the, the, the doing isn't like a physical action. <laughs> exactly. Our relationship with it is kind of like the first, you know, real important thing. And that's exactly right. You know, like, like if we can, you know, be, you know, in some ways, you know, these things are, are like based on our traumas, based on our mm -hmm. patterns coming down through the generations, right. You know, based on, you know, what the guide says was our sole choice to come into these families and carry these, you know, burdens really, you know, and to, to literally get lost inside of them and, 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 you know, yeah. completely, and, and then slowly, gradually, we, we, the creative power within us brings us up into more and more consciousness, right? You know, and so in each lifetime, you know, we're, we're developing from, you know, like when you think of how unconscious we were as children, you know, it's like, mm. and, and again, you know, it doesn't mean that children are, you know, dark beings or bad beings, you know, it's like, it's just that there's, you know, it's, it's like the, they're living in this world, you know, that's completely unconscious. And then, you know, maybe they have access to their divine, you know, being, but they're individuating in this process. And so they're coming in, you know, to learn how to function as this individual being. Now, you know, if we didn't have a system that taught separation, we could individuate, <laughs> yes. 
in, <laughs> in wholeness, right? You know, and and in connection with all of life. So, you know, again, we're hopefully moving in into these directions of, you know, healing these distortions in our current, you know, understanding of things. Um, mm -hmm. But good, yeah, you know, it's like, that's exactly the way. And then, you know, sometimes we see it, sometimes we act it out, you know, but it's all like just learning more about it and not just kind of vaguely, you know? So, so in some ways knowing it's there, you don't have to act it out, you know, but then when you have a moment to yourself or whatever, you can go in and you can talk to all of those parts that surfaced in the pain body, right? And work with mm -hmm. them in, in that way too. So uh, yeah, it's like, and, and that's one way that we can consciously begin to sort of re-imprint our soul substance or, work with this you know soul substance that's already been traumatized right so that we're we're trying to bring the light and the love and the healing into all of those places thank you and thanks for joining us megan i don't know if you've met everybody here I, this is um megan she's in the fredericksburg area frank uh, yeah. is in uh richmond area I don't know if Jacob is still here or not. He was with us, but um, he's down in Roanoke and Dick is out in Denver still, right? As far as I know. <laughs> okay. I'm so, still here. Oh, you're still here there. Good, Jacob. Right. So he's, he continues. He says, let us suppose that you are convinced you can experience only this or that negative manifestation in life. Once you observe the tenacity with which you take this for granted, you can ask, does it really have to be so? The moment you raise the question, you begin to open a crack in the door. You're being unaware that you are convinced of having only this one narrowly confined possibility makes it impossible for you to imagine further alternatives. You can actually venture into them by first formulating your thoughts as the blueprints of creating. Then the world begins to open. The opening must be achieved to begin with by thinking, by saying to yourself, it does not have to be this way. It can be another way. So, you know, we get caught up in the pain bodies, right? You know, and they're kind of operating in this automatic and defensive strategy. And, and you know, it's, it's hard to kind of pull up and wake up out of that. But, you know, even after the fact, you know, we kind of sometimes wake up and then we can see like, yeah, maybe... Maybe it can be a different way um, and, and we can want the other way and want to eliminate whatever stands between us, you know, and another way, a more desirable way. And then we affirm that we have the courage to face, face ourselves, face whatever is there, you know, to go beyond the life experience that we have given ourselves up until now by taking for granted that it cannot be different. So, you know, like this is where the guide talks about the image is this sort of overgeneralization that goes unconscious and then we don't even know it's there. And it functions, you know, kind of in the background until we recognize, oh, there's this, you know, thought form. I was um, on, on a conference call with some pathwork helpers and we were doing some, pro, uh, you know, process and stuff like that together. And, and it was interesting because the leader was, you know, working with another person, but we were, we were sort of also working together and, and, you know, was taking this other person into their childhood trauma after she had worked with me a little bit, but we hadn't kind of like narrowed that down. And then she was asking this other person and it seemed very clear to this other person that their trauma was this, you know, fear of being kicked out. And so there's this subtle belief, you know, that, you know, if you become, if you are who you are, you will be kicked out, right, you know, and, and so when, you know, she said that, you know, the, the leader was trying to get her to really feel that, you know, and, and, you know, take that on and notice, you know, where that goes and, and, you know, the person was able to do some of that, but what was funny was like, that was exactly the same like the minute she said it, like it just tripped me into, you know, my deep feelings, right? You know, and I recognized, oh, that's one of my images, right? You know, that, you know, I'll, I'll be kicked out from the, from the community and from, you know, 
I can't quite fit in. I'm always a little bit different, you know, kind of thing. So these things are like, I mean, you know, even as I say it now, yeah, well, that's true, right? <laughs> you know? But you can see, you know, how it, it, by believing that, you know, it's creative. And if I wanted to, you know, connect in community, maybe in a different way <laughs> than I have until now, I need to, you know, ask these questions, you know, open to these other possibilities. Does it have to be that way? Can it be another way? Perhaps you want a positive result and at the same time you do not wish to accept the logical consequences due to the misconception that they are undesirable for you. Here you have a childish resistance to giving of yourself, a distorted attempt to cheat life and gain more than you wish to give. Life cannot comply with such unfair desires and you feel cheated and resentful because you have not clearly examined the issue. Nor are you aware of your false reasoning when you resist giving of yourself. Thus, you create forms of error and distortion that stand in the way of your unfolding of your possibilities. So, you know, like, I don't know if anybody here recognizes, you know, that, but, you know, and oftentimes he also says, you know, like, we don't, we just don't quite want to, you know, give what it takes, you know, to get, you know, to arrive at what we want, you know, and that kind of thing. So, but the ego, you know, like it does kind of want to, you know, it, it, the ego is oriented, the child state, right, of consciousness, you know, and it's normal for the child state of consciousness. It wants to get, it doesn't want to give, you know, it's like it's the child in you didn't get whatever it needed when you were little, and it's still alive in you, still wanting to get that. And, and so, like, to the degree that we're identified with that aspect of consciousness, you know, we're, we're always, you know, looking outside and trying to get it. But there is this whole other adult, you know, like real need, the guide says, it's a real adult need to give, to, to be aware of our own growth, right? So, you know, and, and most of you, I think, probably know of the, of the, the joy and the value and the goodness of giving, of yourself right you know most of us here have not completely <laughs> crawled into this hole but you know we may have some aspects of that in certain areas so he says you can see the level of your conscious thinking is influenced by both your destructive side and the universal spirit you can choose consciously in which direction to shape your thoughts once you are aware of their habitual patterns this self-determination is your key to liberation. You will see more and more clearly that your destructive side is also something you choose. And this is very important, you know, like, you know, like there's this kind of unconscious negative intentionality that we need to penetrate, you know, that's sometimes not so obvious, but it's often there. And, and if we can't penetrate it, we can't, we can't transform it. So, it's, it's not something that befalls you, right? You know, the, this destructive side of ourselves. And, uh, you know, I feel that a lot, you know, like I can't help myself, you know, <laughs> I, just, I just get that way, right? Um, but, you know, it's like, ultimately that's not self-responsible, right? You know, and it's not ultimate truth. And yet from the unconscious place where you just feel possessed and taken over and it happens like before you can even wake up, it does, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a truth to that. Um, but it's like, here's where, you know, we have to work to wake up in, in ways and work. Usually it's because we go unconscious because of the trauma. And so if we do the work with the trauma, then we can clear this, right? And the work with the trauma, the guide says, is that we have to go back and, and hold ourselves and feel that original pain. And, and what we're feeling now mostly is all of the defense against feeling that pain, all of the strategies that we have developed to avoid it. So once we can, you know, fall back in as an adult into this place that we've been defending against going for the rest, you know, the, all of our lives, 
then we discover that it wasn't what we thought, that you know, we can feel it, that it actually sets us free and, and we're okay. And then you know, it, it liberates all of the defensive reactions within us. Um, so you know, there's the emotional side as well of, of you know, dying into our feelings that we're, we're, we're working with in a kind of shaman's death aspect to the work. So he says, once you've progressed on the path to the point to discover, to the point where you finally admit the deliberate desire to choose destructive attitudes, you can see that you're actually forsaking happiness, fulfillment, bliss, fruitful living. You may be terribly unhappy about the result, but you will nevertheless insist on hanging on to your negative will. And you can see how all important it is to find this out. The old age question is, what brought all this about? Why do human beings harbor these senseless desires? What does the mind want to take? Why does the mind want to take this direction? Religion calls it sin or evil. Psychology calls it neurosis or psychosis, among other things. Whatever name you give it, it is indeed a disease. And this is also something that Paul Levy gets into in the quantum thing, you know, is this, you know, quantum state of conscious disease that's infecting the world right you know it's like a mind virus that that we're needing to become more conscious of and it's through our own work with our own you know negativity in this way you know in our own little realm of the universe that you know we really have the biggest impact so he says in order to heal the disease it is necessary to understand it to some extent primarily by following your own erroneous assumptions and beliefs to the emotions and will direction they create. So again, we don't wanna just suppress, we wanna listen and understand and work with them. Without understanding the dynamics of mental creativity, both in the positive and in the negative sense, this can be achieved only to a limited degree. People often ask, how does evil come into existence? Why did God put evil into us? As though someone had, put anything anywhere, once you have sufficient self-awareness and discover that it is you who rejects happiness, the same puzzling question may be put differently. Why do I do it? Why can't I want what feels good for me? This question has been asked here as well as elsewhere in the world many times, wherever spiritual teachings are being given. Once a long time ago, at the beginning of this contact, I gave, even gave an allegorical account of the so-called fall of the angels. I talked about a spirit who was once utterly constructive, expanding into forever greater realms of light and bliss, who deviated from this course, separating himself from his innermost God self and became fragmented. How did he turn into those dark destructive channels? Any such account given here or elsewhere is easily misunderstood when interpreted as a historical event that took place in time and space. I shall venture now to give another explanation about how destructiveness comes into being in a wholly constructive consciousness in this moment, you know, in this day, every day. I shall try to find a different approach that may reach you on some level and give you a deeper understanding of this all important topic. You can then meet your own destructiveness with a new understanding and eventually come out of it. Picture my friends, a consciousness, a state of being in which there's only bliss and infinite power to create with one's own consciousness. Consciousness is among other things, a thinking apparatus. Thus it thinks and lo, something comes into existence. It wills and lo, what is willed and thought is. Life is endlessly filled with possibilities. <clears throat> Creating starts with thinking, and then the thinking takes on form, becomes a fact in the life beyond the confines of the ego. So it's projected out into the soul substance. In the life that is free, where consciousness is free floating, free flowing and free floating. And there the thought immediately takes form and becomes deed. It is only in the human ego that thought seems separate from form and deed. The less awareness an entity has, the more separated thought, form, and deed appear to the extent that form seems entirely independent from the deed and the deed from the thought or the will. None of these stages seem connected. 
An essential part of raising one's consciousness lies precisely in making this connection. No matter how separate in time and space they may appear, thought, will, action, and manifestation are all one unit. In the state of being, where there is no confinement, where there is no tight structuring, this unit is experienced as a living reality of indescribable bliss and fascination. The whole universe is open for exploration, for new ways of self-expression and self-finding, giving form to forever more worlds, more experience, more effects. The fascination of creating is endless. Since the possibilities are infinite, consciousness can also explore itself by confining itself, by fragmenting itself to see what happens as it were. To experience itself, it contracts instead of expanding. Instead of exploring further light, it wants to see how it is to feel and experience darkness. Creating is pure fascination. This fascination is not eliminated simply because what is created is at first perhaps slightly less pleasurable or blissful or brilliant. Even in that may lie a special fascination and adventure. Then the creation begins to take on a power of its own. For everything that is created has energy invested in it. And this energy is self-perpetuating. It takes on its own momentum. The consciousness who has created these pathways may experiment longer and going beyond what is safe. It no longer leaves itself enough power at the moment to reverse the course. Thus, the consciousness may get lost in its own momentum and willing to stop. Later, it no longer sees how to stop. Creation then takes place in a negative sense until the results are so unpleasant that the consciousness seeks to get a hold on itself and counteract the momentum by recalling its knowledge of what could be. At any rate, it knows there is no real danger for whatever suffering you human beings feel is truly illusory in the ultimate sense. Once you find your true identity within, you will know it. It is all a play, a fascination, an experiment from which your real state of being can be recaptured if only you will truly try. Now, many human beings still find themselves in the state in which they do not yet want to really try. They still find fascination in the exploration of negative creation, at least to some extent. Some separated entities have never gone beyond the point where they lose the immediate awareness of who they really are and of their power to redirect their explorations. And others have temporarily lost this awareness, but they will find it again the moment they really want to. It is well that all of you should remember this. The momentum of creating contains incredibly powerful energies. These energies have impact. They impress the all-pervading creative substance, the stuff which responds to creative mind. This substance then is molded into form, event, object, state of mind, whatever. The imprints in the soul substance are so deep that nothing but the greater power of molding mind can erase false imprints which govern your life events. Mind or consciousness impresses. Life substance is impressed upon. Everything around and within you participates in both the masculine principle of a determining etching consciousness and the feminine principle of a molded responding life substance. Find this truth within you and the universe will become yours all over again as it once was. Thus, if the creative consciousness does not alter the course at a certain point, it becomes caught within its own process. Part of the power and momentum of consciousness is the quality of being self-imitating. So he goes into another piece here that I wanna talk about. Let me pause just a second and see, is there any, how are we doing any comments or questions about all of that? 
Well, it sounds like he started with talking a little section here about talking about fallen angels, and then he evolved into back into the human element. But it sounds like he's also saying that we are the same as the angels in that somehow we decided we wanted to see what the dark side looked like. And then now we're in it. Now we have to come back out of it. Am I uh, a short synopsis of that kind of? Yeah, good. Yeah. And, 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 and then he's saying, you know, like the only thing that can, you know, stop this momentum that we have had and going is, is our own, you know, creative consciousness and our own choice, right? You know, it's part of our willing as well, right? You know, our free will choice. But we can't, until we realize what we're doing, you know, we, we can't even activate that. So, and then he talks a little bit more about sort of this consciousness and fascination with creation by this talking about this power and momentum of this quality of being self-imitating. And I think this may be useful some, for some people. You know, it's hard to convey, he says, this aspect of creative energy. Human beings frequently experience the urge to imitate others. And he uses this kind of, you know, kind of gross image, you know, of like how you, you know, you might have a facial, see somebody with a facial tick or a lamp, and, and we have this kind of strange urge sometimes to imitate, right? And, and I would say, you know, like how I experience it more is a kind of mirroring, and I think we all do this to some degree unconsciously, you know, so what, what, what somebody's consciousness presents to us, like we mirror back. And like, oftentimes, you know, we, we feel like, you know, we're not responding, you know, because we're just kind of responding to the consciousness, you know, but, but this is where I think we also, you know, need to realize, yeah, well, we do mirror back and that is an aspect of consciousness. And sometimes maybe it can even be used for the, you know, for the divine self or for, you know, good purposes, but, and, and it certainly can be used to be helped to wake up, right, you know, but that you know in the dynamics between people like if we can you know recognize that and see if we can you know stand in our own higher self space rather than in this you know inner mirroring process so he says the power and the energies of creation have a self perpetuating effect that only consciousness with its knowing will and determination can alter. Creating becomes so involving and the pleasure of it so engrossing that once set in a negative direction, the pleasure continues to keep the soul in its spell until consciousness steps in with its deliberate counterforce. Even if what is created is painful, the pleasure of creating is difficult to abandon as long as the individual ignores that positive creation is also possible. And so this is also another way that he says, you know, like we, we don't want to give up the, the negative pleasure, right? You know, uh, and it, you know, that we get out of it. So in that sense, you know, we feel like we'll be bereft of something, right? If we give it up. But what he's saying is if we have this understanding that, you know, the positive pleasure that we can create is so much better than the negative pleasure that we receive out of any of these strategies that, you know, like we, we, when we can begin to wrap our mind around that and see that possibility, like then we begin to want to make that choice a little more easily. So as negative creations proceed, consciousness seems to become more and more fragmented, which is really not so, my friends. What happens is that you lose awareness of your connection with the world, world spirit, which is who you are. <coughs> <coughs> if you do not know to what extent these were, I do not know to what extent these words can reach you, but if they can, they will prove of tremendous help for you as you meditate and think about them. They will help you not only to comprehend, but to find the right way to eliminate the destructiveness within you. It is the power of your mind that creates the negative. This force is even stronger when it is used for the positive, because in the negative, negative, there are always conflicts, contrary longings, and will directions that weaken the force. In the constructive expanding direction, this need not be so. 
once the switch is made, something will click in your mind. Your consciousness will flow into a new direction that comes more easily and naturally without the torture inherent in the negative creation. <clears throat> the more consciousness has separated itself from the whole, the more fragmented it becomes, the greater the structure it creates. This was very useful and interesting for me. I had not seen it quite this way before because I always feel like in some ways I'm fight, fussing and fighting against structure, uh, especially how most of the world seems to think that they need it. And it seems like way over, overdone. But in this way, you know, it's like, you know, like if people's need for structure is coming out of the chaos that I'm sowing because I'm, you know, natively creating, you know, then you can, you can kind of see where you know, the structure is needed. And that's what he's saying here. So he says, the wholeness of consciousness is unstructured. It is the state of being in all its blissfulness. <clears throat> Once fragmentation has occurred, lost consciousness gradually works toward a state of self-consciousness. This state needs structure to protect it from the chaos of negativity and destruction, its own, you know, presumably, you know, the mirroring of others. When negativity is met and eliminated, unstructured blissful consciousness is attained again. The ego with its confinement is the structure that protects the entity from its own destructive creating. <clears throat> and so people kind of want us to control or they want to set boundaries, right? You know, now I think that's really an outer reflection of an inner process that needs to get, you know, more clarity in terms of what it's, you know, reflecting back on the internal levels of things. But, um, you know, it's like we, we do learn to kind of hold the destructive urges in check, you know, or maybe where there's trauma and PTSD, we we have difficulty doing that. And then only when consciousness expands in bliss and truth can the structure be removed. <clears throat> and that's kind of like also, I think, implied in a lot of the, you know, spiritual teachings about, you know, like once we can truly stay firm in love, live in a consciousness that stays out of judgment and, and in compassion and in love and, you know, in presencing and in surrender, you know, and not trying to change anybody or anything, right, you know, then, then when we can hold that state of love, right, then probably we can follow and, and the structure, you know, can be removed and the guidance will just flow. Um, but, you know, until then, and so in one of my hymns even says, you know, like, you know, and once we bow to this love, once we truly align with it, right, then everything that we don't know now awakens inside, right? And so we can't have access to this larger self that we are, to everything that we can create, to all of the potentiality and possibility of positive creation until we confirm ourselves in the positive and in the space of, of love and do this purification work. So at one point in your evolution, you work chaotic, chaotically unstructured. As you grow and evolve, the structuring walls off the chaos so that at least for a while, consciousness can function without being hindered by the inner chaos. I think what's happening now is, you know, that those walls are breaking down and the inner chaos and the outer chaos is increasing everywhere. So the thinking process is available to your consciousness can then become the tools to show the way out of negative creations and confining structuring. So, you know, we, we get stuck in the confining structuring and the negative creation, but then it's like we get, that begins to help us awaken and use and learn how to use the creative process and the thinking process to work our way beyond the, <clears throat> you know, the negative looping, the negative vicious circle. So looking beyond the structure and into the chaos comprehending it, realizing the power of the mental processes you constantly use, affords you the possibility to reverse the downward curve that makes you ceaselessly seek ways to deny life, love, pleasure, happiness, and to court decay, waste, and pain. The part of your universal self that has remained whole 
knows the pain is short and illusory, but the part of you that is in chaos does not know this and suffers. Let us review. Conscious processes can swing the pendulum from destructive creating to the original state of consciousness and expanding blissful creating. The confining structure will dissolve in the ultimate state of being unstructured consciousness and experience energy and blissful being will reinstate themselves and become your existence. This is where it is all going, my friends. Part of your attempts must therefore go in the direction of bringing order into the confusion of the workings of your mind, its self-involvement, its blindness to itself and its tendency to get lost to itself. It is not the world outside yourself that confuses you. It is the world within your own consciousness that does so. <clears throat> you can now begin to contemplate how you can deliberately will creative construction. You can do it by consciously formulating, thinking and willing a state of happiness, aliveness, fulfillment, truth, love, growth, both in general and in particular detail. You need not you need to acclimatize yourself to it, picture yourself in such states and call upon the universal power within to fortify your conscious mind with the necessary creative energies. <clears throat> so again, here he brings in this kind of idea that, you know, we have to reach a little bit, you know, we have to ask, we have to call upon, you know, this larger aspect of ourselves. And yet we also have to be quiet and still and inside open and willing to be receptive to receive its response, right? And so the will to happiness, you know, then can become strong and the cause for unhappiness can be seen and eliminated. And this is really, you know, what we want, right? And it also, it must be what we want in order to manifest it. So then the creative power will grow. The divine self will inspire you and show the way. You will learn to recognize it and receive it in your conscious brain. This is a rough outline or plan for this working season. So he's going to be giving some more lectures along these lines. And so we'll probably continue in this vein as well on these Wednesday calls. He says, the progress that has been made by my friends will enable them to make use of what I have said here. I mean, actively make use, not just reading this as a beautiful theory, but deeply knowing its immediate value and applying it every day of your life. On the day when you see your destructive creating and then deliberately change it, you will indeed have done something wonderful. The will to be happy, to unfold in life is the foundation of your power to create. The more concisely this is formulated and the greater your willingness is to eliminate attitudes that hinder the result, the more effective your creation will become. Be blessed, receive the power that is streaming forth and increase it in your conscious, deliberate, willing expressions and formulations. Express your willingness to grow, to be happy, to be constructive. So this is our inner intention. This is our choosing, right? So we, we, we you know, can't just make it happen by our outer will, but we can choose it with our deepest being and with our wholest being that we can connect with, right? You know, not excluding, of course, the parts of us that are maybe still trapped in some negative creating, but our true self, our real nature, right? We know this is what we want. And so we do this not by willing in a tight, insistent, constricted way, not by demanding or feeling anxious and hoping, you know, but in a relaxed, confident way, contemplating that all possibilities exist as potential realities, realizable the moment you know and will them with your undivided being. The power is there, it is in you. All you have to do is to tap it, use it. Build with your conscious mind the channels that can free it and become very quiet and calm. Listen and tune in on it. It is there forever and ever in its majestic power, 
in its wonderful wisdom, in its ultimate knowledge that there is nothing but bliss already now within you. Okay. So, let's see if there's any final comments or questions, or I can go back to sharing if we need to, but. I just have to pipe up for a second and say, I watched this play out in an interaction that I had today in which, you know, a promise had been made. So then there was an expectation and then that was not going to be followed through on. And then there were, you know, those feelings of like, but we discussed and we agreed and, and this is not what we agreed. So I didn't like, I didn't expect you to say yes to the thing. You did that. You chose to. And now it's not really me. Like, it's you canceling. And I, and then I was like, no, stop. You are going all the way down the negative script rabbit hole. Like, stop. Okay. So accept whatever way this goes now, because divine acceptance is continuing to accept over and over and over again, even though it sucks sometimes. And I did that. And then the conversation flowed in such a way that it, it ended on a good note and then came back around to immediately going back to following through on the thing that had been promised and like, nope, never mind. We made it work. And I didn't demand, like, it was not a demand. It was not the way the conversation ended. It was none of those things. It was like opening to, okay, well, it might change. Let me know which way it goes. And I'm going to do my thing in the interim. And then it just flowed right back. Excellent. Great example. Exactly. And, 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 you know, and, and sometimes it can be interesting and useful to like, when you find yourself, you know, like kind of blindsided by, you know, somebody else's decision, you know, it's, it's so tempting and so easy to think, you know, well, you know, they just did that. Right. You know, but it's kind of like, it's your dream. <laughs> you <know? Yeah>. So, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. why are you manifesting that? Right. You know, so sometimes we can go in and see some other parts of the unconscious at work in, in those kind of questionings, but great, fabulous. Exactly. And that's what you want is just the you know, opening and then, then the universe, you know, this quantum field can take over and miracles happen. Yes. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Good example, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, that may be it for this evening. Thanks Thank everybody you. for joining me and I'm going to be on my journey out west. I'm going to be, I guess, passing through Denver at some point, Dick. I, <laughs> I could look you up on my way if you want a travel, traveling visitor. I don't know. Um, no, that's I'm, great. I'm, yeah, let me know. Give me, give me your itinerary when you're ready. Okay. Yeah, I I'm, I'm think I'm leaving around the first and going to go up north and, you know, through Minnesota and up to Montana and then down into Wyoming where my parents are I, were taking their ashes where they requested and it's up in the wilderness of, of Wyoming. And so the family will meet there and go on a pack trip up into that country and then come back down and I'll go to Utah um, where most of them are living now and hang out there for a little while and then head back home through Denver. <laughs> So, wow, what a, that's an adventure. Wow. Yeah, 5,000 miles. I'm going to take it, try to take it slow, see if I can not go too crazy during it. <laughs> With or without your husband. <laughs> we'll see what I'm going to manifest on the journey, right? Big vision quest. <laughs> Thank okay. You. Was Take nice. care, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night Thanks, Darlene. Yes. Best wishes on your trip. Take good care. Yeah. Bye bye.